our esteemed conference convener, Professor John Cavadini. Professor Cavadini is a professor, is a professor of theology and spent um, over 10 years, 13 years, serving as its department head from 1997 to 2010. In addition, he is the McGrath Cavadini Director of the Institute for Church Life. In addition to his extensive scholarship in patristics, with a particular emphasis in Augustine and Origen, Professor Cavadini is also a beloved teacher and mentor who integrates the highest level of intellectual life with a keen pastoral vision and a commitment to the life of the church. He has served as a consultant on, for the USCCB since 2006 and was appointed to the International Theological Commission in 2009 by Pope Benedict XVI. Pope Benedict also created him a member of the Equestrian Order of St. Gregory the Great, making him the only person in this room who can ride a horse through Vatican Square. <laughs> Please join me, join me in welcoming Professor Cavadini back to our conference and to the podium. His talk, A Pro-Life Spirituality of Dignity, Gratitude, and Wonder. Thank you, I paid her to say those things. <laughs> I appreciate it. Sorry I wasn't here earlier, I had class, and so I'm back from class. I actually changed the title of my paper a little bit, because uh, I wanted to try to reflect the sort of problematic of our conference uh, as to whether we were at the end of human dignity or not in terms of the usefulness of this concept. So here's the new title, Stupid or Smart, Useless or Useful. Clearing the concept, clarifying the concept of human dignity from the gospel of life. So my thought was to study this encyclical to see if this concept of human dignity um, could emerge from the study with a little bit more clarity. There's plenty of places to sit, friends. Why is it so difficult to define the concept of human dignity? Is it, after all, a useless concept? <clears throat> and for good measure, stupid too. That's Stephen Pinker's term. Further, is the concept of human dignity something that is essentially tied to revelation? Or is it fully accessible to unaided human reason, alone, a clear and distinct philosophical truth? <clears throat> if it were the latter, then why would it be so hard to define and so difficult to replace? If it were the former, that is essentially tied to revelation, how can we Christians expect it to take hold in a civil society which is not even officially theistic, never mind Christian? In a way, the catechism's handling of the idea of human dignity exemplifies these issues. The Catechism introduces the idea of human dignity very beautifully with citations from Gaudium et Spes as part of the article on creation. Quote, of all visible creatures, only man is able to know and love his creator. He is the only creature on earth that God has willed for its own sake, and he alone is called to share by knowledge and love in God's own life. It was for this end that he was created, and this is the fundamental reason for his dignity." End quote. Again, being in the image of God, the human individual possesses the dignity of a person who is not just something, but someone, as we've just heard from John O'Callaghan. In these passages, teaching regarding human dignity is intrinsically connected to the doctrine of creation as a revealed doctrine involving a supernatural vocation. And yet, this very same teaching regarding the dignity of the human person is something, at the same time, which grounds the teaching on social justice and includes a universal obligation independent of faith. Quote, 
social justice can be obtained only in respecting the transcendent dignity of man, of the human, of the human person. The person represents the ultimate end of society, which is ordered to him or her. Quote, what is at stake, this is a quote within a quote, what is at stake is the dignity of the human person whose defense and promotion have been entrusted to us by the creator and to whom the, the men and women at every moment of history are strictly and responsibly in debt, end quote. That's the catechism quoting John Paul II. Human dignity is later taken in the catechism to be the essential basis for claims about the equality of all human beings. So already in the catechism, you have this issue of, on the one hand, human dignity is a revealed doctrine based on the doctrine of creation. And on the other hand, it's a doctrine that's somehow accessible to everyone and binding on everyone, the, res the respect of it. So accessible to reason somehow. I take the claims about dignity being useless or even a stupid concept to be claims operative in and presuming a secular society. The objection stemming from the way in which claims about dignity cannot be grounded except by appeal to God. I think we can agree from our quick tour through the catechism that human dignity sits a little awkwardly at the intersection of revelation and natural reason with conflicting implications for both its necessity in public discourse on the one hand and its uselessness or even stupidity in such discourse on the other. I believe that John Paul II in his encyclical The Gospel of Life offers a major resource for helping us to think about the concept of human dignity specifically as a concept that functions in two very different discourses and can, for that very reason, seem difficult to define. And yet, for that very reason, can also be understood as so useful that it is indispensable and irreplaceable, precisely because no other concept can function across these two discourses as it does. So, the gospel of life certainly situates human dignity at just the awkward intersection between two discourses that we have noticed from the catechism. Because of this, the text sometimes tries to find a synonym, if not an outright definition, for human dignity. Under pressure and squeezed as it is between two seemingly incommensurable ways of thinking. So that pressure constitutes pressure towards finding a synonym. Citing the way in which, quote, believers in Christ must defend and promote the right to life in a special way, end quote, the text notes as justification one of the most famous passages in Gaudium et Spes as informing the awareness of the believer, namely, quote, by his incarnation, the Son of God has united himself in some fashion with every human being a saving event that reveals to humanity the incomparable value of every human person. That second part is John Paul II's comment on the earlier passage from Gaudium et Spes. So it is clear that the incomparable value of every human person there is intended as, if not a synonym for human dignity, then a gesture towards one. For the phrase, dignity of the person appears right in the next sentence. The gospel of God's love for human beings, the gospel of the dignity of the person, and the gospel of life are a single and indivisible gospel, end quote. But this sentence only increases the mystery of how human dignity can then function on its own, as it were, in the discourse of a secular society where defending human dignity cannot be coincident with preaching the gospel. In fact, the suggestion of a synonym for the phrase human dignity, though it finds a few echoes later in the document, is never extended anywhere close to the point of replacing the word dignity or the concept of human dignity with some supposed equivalent, even the incomparable value of every human person. We can try to understand why from looking closely at a section where the transition between the language of revelation and the language of reason 
on its own is more drawn out and the awkward place of intersection at which the concept of human dignity sits is featured with more singular focus. And this is the opening of the second chapter of Evangelium Vitae. Given countless threats to the right to life, the people of God, this is a quote, and this includes every believer, is called to profess with humility and courage its faith in Jesus Christ, the word of life. The gospel of life is not simply a reflection, however new and profound, on human life. Nor is it merely a commandment aimed at raising awareness and bringing about significant changes in society. The gospel of life is something concrete and personal, for it consists in the proclamation of the very person of Jesus. In Christ, the gospel of life is definitively proclaimed and revealed. That's obviously, essentially tying it to Revelation. He goes on to say, quote, this is the gospel which already present in the revelation of the Old Testament and indeed written in the heart of every man and woman has echoed in every conscience from the beginning, from the time of creation itself, in such a way that despite the negative consequences of sin, it can also be known in its essential traits by human reason, end quote. Since the gospel of life is indivisibly the gospel of the dignity of the human person, as the earlier quote mentioned, we can conclude that the dignity of the human person in its essentials can be known by human reason because the doctrine of creation itself is not fully revealed until God's creative power is made perfect in weakness on the cross. Until then, the meaning of anything created is not fully revealed. Quote, revelation progressively allows what is planted by the creator in the human heart to be grasped with ever greater clarity, end quote. This includes the intuition of human dignity. John Paul II explains that the poor, who are familiar to readers of the Old Testament and who are in some way the core representatives of Israel, are also present in the New Testament. Such that, he says, quote, the Son of God proclaims to all who feel threatened and hindered that their lives, too, are a good, to which the Father's love gives meaning and value, end quote. Again, quote, it is above all the poor to whom Jesus speaks in his preaching and actions. We heard about that last night from Father Gustavo. The crowds of the sick and the outcasts who follow him and seek him out find in his words a revelation of the great value of their lives, end quote. Commenting on Peter's cure of the cripple who was begging at the beautiful gate of the temple, John Paul II observes, quote, by faith in Jesus, the author of life, life which lies abandoned and cries out for help, regains self-esteem and full dignity, end quote. A little later, John Paul II, same chapter here, quotes 2 Corinthians 8, 9, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And he comments very movingly on this passage, quote, the poverty of which Paul speaks is not only a stripping of divine privileges, but also a sharing in the lowliest and most vulnerable conditions of human life. End quote. This poverty is, we could say, the revelation of the full dimensions of human dignity. The preferential option for the poor, sorry, John. <laughs> the preferential option for the poor, revealed in Christ's own choice of poverty, is contrasted in John Paul II's text with the rich landowner in the gospel who, who quote, thinks he can make his life secure by the possession of material goods, end quote and thereby has never really appreciated the real meaning of his own life. Money is not the source of dignity, though we can act that way, confusing dignity with social status. It turns out that, that the preferential option for the poor, a datum not of reason, but of revelation, is the preferential option for human dignity. Because the poor are us, all of us, when shorn of everything we prefer in assessing status and worth. The concept of human dignity can be illuminated, but not in the end replaced by 
the incomparable value or worth of every human being, because the phrase tempts us to use our own assessments of value and worth, potentially to contaminate the idea. After all, we know that some human beings are worth more than others in many ways of calculating and assessing worth, in every way, probably, except this one. And so to use the language of value or worth seems to put what is referred to as dignity on a sliding scale. The concept of human dignity is thus as irreducible as the preferential option for the poor. And in some ways, it is these that are the true equivalents, that is, preferential option for the poor and human dignity, not language about incomparable worth, although such a phrase is a useful gloss, just as John Paul II uses it in the encyclical. Perhaps the reason that human dignity is so difficult to define is that, like the category poor, there is no there there. It is essentially a poverty or a lack that is being indicated. Though I hasten to add, this does not mean that human dignity is being defined by a lack or by vulnerability. Instead, the preferential option to the poor, human dignity, indicates that, in a sense, it is the lack that is preferred. Both place a positive valence on the lack. To try to define human dignity, then, as a clear and distinct philosophical idea is to some extent to defeat it. Because instead of allowing a positive valence to be placed on a lack, it tends to fill in the lack with achievements, status, qualifications, worth of various kinds. Human dignity is an inalien inalienable value which can neither be compared nor negotiated on a scale of any other value. And the concept is useful precisely to the extent that a person has nothing more than this value and useless to the extent that it is confused with any competing value. Its true coordinates are, in fact, dimensions of uselessness, such as injury, vulnerability, poverty, sickness, severely compromised or non-existent autonomy, silence, distance, otherness, and even annihilation. For human dignity is not entirely extinguished even in death, and we are responsible to treat with honor even a corpse, not to mention the dignity attaching to that most useless of all human beings, the enemy. Thus the problem with assessing not only human dignity, but the concept of human dignity by its utility or lack thereof is that it is precisely the consideration of utility that obscures human dignity and that can therefore blind us to the meaning of the concept of human dignity and hence its usefulness. As John Paul II puts it in Evangelium Vitae, the opposite of a calculus of human dignity is to value efficiency over persons and having over being. Quote, the first to be harmed are women, children, the sick or suffering, and the elderly. The criterion of personal dignity, which demands respect, generosity, and service, is replaced by the criterion of efficiency, functionality, and usefulness. Others are considered not for what they are, but for what they have, do, and produce." End quote. This, John Paul II dryly adds, is the supremacy of the strong over the weak. End quote. The trouble with trying to find a fully equivalent, clear and distinct philosophical idea with which to translate or replace the phrase human dignity with something else is that it imagines a more obvious criterion of value will be found that will verify its own utility instead of demanding that we, the powerful, the ones capable of thought, the reasonable, respond to the value indicated by the phrase. To try to define human dignity means to try to find the reason for that dignity, apart from simple, unadorned human life and human being. To be tempted, at least, quote, to recognize as a subject of rights only the person who enjoys full or at least incipient autonomy and who emerges from a state of total dependence on others, end quote. Continuing a little later on, quote, 
In this case, it is force, which becomes a criterion for choice and action in interpersonal relations and social life. But this is the exact opposite of what a state ruled by law as a community in which the reasons of force are replaced by the force of reason historically intended to affirm, end quote. It may be then that to, that to insist too hard on a clear and distinct definition for the phrase human dignity, in order for it to have full operationality, is to veer into the use of reason as a kind of force, to veer into the territory of the corruption of reason, the search for a clear and distinct idea is the search for something presumably whose utility can be demonstrated. And yet in this case, the search for something obviously useful involves a denial of the utter uselessness of the deployment of the concept, of the way in which its successful deployment will not be recognized in efficiency, in having, in doing, per se, but in descending into what will seem like inefficiency, losing, and mere being, and indeed stupidity. It may turn out that one condition for the proper use of reason is the acceptance of the idea of human dignity as such, with full awareness of all the lacks with which it is most properly coordinated, and thus with the sacrifices that it will require of anyone who accepts the phrase at face value. Similarly, on one level, the preferential option for the poor is not rational or reasonable, and to use reason to reduce it to reason is to abuse both reason and the concept of the preferential option for the poor itself. To leave the concept of human dignity or the preferential option for the poor undefined and unencumbered, one might say, by the demand, by the demand for a clear and distinct philosophical idea is to preserve both as indicators of the embrace of lack that is, indicators of sacrifice that will be required to respect human dignity and even to see what it means. The trouble with assessing dignity or the concept of dignity based on any kind of utility is that it tempts us to think we can understand the concept without a concomitant willingness to sacrifice freely, without being forced into it. To assess dignity by any kind of usefulness is to assess it implicitly by how much power a person has, by how much the person is able to defend him or herself, to speak up, to lobby, or to enlist others who can speak up for him or her, to force one to a sacrifice one would not have freely made. On a scale where utility is invoked, the weakest, quote, that is, quote, the hungry, the thirsty, the foreigner, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, end quote, lose dignity, and the unborn child along with the indigent elderly, are, at, are, are the most at risk of losing dignity altogether because they are entirely unable to assert their claims and rights and the sacrifices that would be required if they could. These weakest and most defenseless members of society are, in a sense, the poorest of the poor because they have no power at all. They seem to have no dignity worth mentioning because they cannot mention it. They may have the additional and seeming indignity of being unaware of their dignity, so that it is easiest of all to take it from them. It seems as though we have taken nothing at all, like taking candy from a baby. No. It seems as though we have taken nothing at all because what we took was useful to no one, and no sacrifice is required when nothing useful is lost. For all of the reasons given, John Paul II does not waste time trying to define human dignity in Evangelium Vitae, but in providing us the coordinates for understanding what is at stake in defending it. John Paul II has shown how the gospel of life or the gospel of human dignity from which it is indivisible is something available to reason itself, though glimpsed in its fullness only by faith. This is partly because sin obscures reason when its perfect and objective use would require a sacrifice. And partly, and perhaps mainly, because it is only, quote, by contemplating the precious blood of Christ, the sign of his self-giving love, that the believer learns to recognize and appreciate the, the almost divine dignity of every human being, end quote. The believer is thus uniquely equipped to bring to mind 
to all persons of goodwill the meaning of human dignity and its defense by advocating for social practices and a social ethos that are entirely discernible from within a philosophical deployment of reason. That is, practices stemming from an ethos that value persons over efficiency and having over being. How much more philosophical can you get than that? This is not a translation of the concept of human dignity into secular terms, but it is to thematize social practices coordinate with human dignity in language that is accessible to reason alone. For example, quote, in a word, we can say that the cultural change which we are calling for demands from everyone the courage to adopt a new lifestyle consisting in making practical choices on the basis of a correct scale of values, the primacy of being over having, of the person over things, end quote. This is what John Paul II calls a culture of life, which might just as easily be called a culture of human dignity. Human dignity is an idea available to reason precisely in its resistance to being manipulated by reason as something, in short, not to be defined, but to bear witness to. And because believers are uniquely positioned to see the full dimension of human dignity, because the gospel exceeds every human expectation and reveals the sublime heights to which the dignity of the human person is raised through grace, that's a quote, believers are supremely positioned to bear the witness appropriate to human dignity because we can do it out of, quote, gratitude and joy at the incomparable dignity of man, end quote, that has been revealed. With regard to this matter, John Paul II notes, quote, that we need, first of all, to foster in ourselves and in others a contemplative outlook. Such outlook, an outlook arises from faith in the God of life, who has created every individual as a wonder, quote, unquote. Later on, John Paul II continues, like the psalmist, we exclaim with overwhelming joy, I give you thanks that I am fearfully, wonderfully made, Wonderful are your works. Moreover, man and his life appear to us not only as one of the greatest marvels of creation, for God has granted to man a dignity which is near to divine. We are called to express wonder and gratitude for the gift of life, end quote. Wonder and gratitude for the gift of life, for life as a gift, is a basic pro-life spirituality. And because life at its absolutely most vulnerable and helpless is in this encyclical a synecdoche, that means the part for the whole, a synecdoche for the lack and poverty that are the two principal coordinates of human dignity, this is also indivisibly a spirituality of human dignity. As John Paul II makes clear in the passage just quoted, nor is this a zero-sum game with regard to the rest of life on our planet. Even in this encyclical, the teaching of which Pope Francis has developed in Laudato Si, John Paul II makes it clear that a sense of wonder in the supreme dignity of the human person spills over, as it were, into a sense of renewed wonder at all of life and at all of the wonders of creaturely existence on our planet, which is our common home. Thus, Believers are called to bear witness to the wonder of creation through the gratitude they cultivate for this gift. This spirituality of wonder and gratitude is not expressed in continual oohs and ahs at everything we see, though every once in a while a few oohs and ahs couldn't hurt, but rather in, the, in practices that tend towards a culture characterized by the preference for being over having and persons over efficiency. That is the essential of a culture of life that can be articulated and understood on the basis of unaided reason, which can include considerations, by the way, about transcendent reality, God included, philosophically considered. Believers practice this culture of life as a culture of witness to something that transcends even the transcendence of a philosophically construed practice of human dignity but this witness does not have to be afraid of engaging the culture where and how it can be engaged without, except where appropriate, 
an explicit proclamation of the gospel. But that does not mean that the believer's perspective is simply an added tier of extras onto what is philosophically adequate or good enough. John Paul II says, quote, that the gospel of life includes everything that human experience and reason tells us about the value of human life, accepting it, purifying it, exalting it, and bringing it to fulfillment, end quote. The full depth of the gospel of life, which is indivisible from the gospel of human dignity, is made available to the believer whose contemplative outlook is focused on Jesus himself, namely, quote, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, end quote. Again, the unconditional choice for life, it's a quote, indistinguishable from the unconditional choice for human dignity, quote, reaches its full religious and moral meaning when it flows from, is formed by, and nourished by faith in Christ. Nothing helps us so much to positively face the conflict between death and life in which we are engaged as faith in the Son of God, who became man and dwelt among human beings so that they may have life and have it abundantly. It is a matter of faith in the risen Lord who has conquered death, faith in the blood of Christ that speaks more graciously than the blood of Abel. End quote. You'll recognize Hebrews 12, 24. This is because contemplating the blood of Christ enables us to see most clearly and most deeply the bonds of human solidarity, which are seen to arise from the vocation to self-gift, surely not the basis of but surely the fulfillment of the concept of human dignity. Quote, Christ's blood reveals to man that his greatness and therefore his vocation consists in the sincere gift of self. Precisely because it is poured out as the gift of life, the blood of Christ is no longer a sign of death, of definitive separation from the brethren, but the instrument of communion, which is richness of life for all, end quote. If contemplating the precious blood of Christ in wonder means contemplating the almost divine dignity of every human being in wonder, this means contemplating the sacrifice of Christ as a contemplation of the dignity of every human being. The deepest awareness of human dignity entails at one and the same time awareness of sacrifice or self-gift, which is in turn awareness of the ultimate basis for human solidarity to generate a culture of being over having, of persons over efficiency, will always entail a personal sacrifice. And if poverty ultimately means early and unjust death, as Gustavo Gutierrez always reminds us, we can see that the preferential option for the poor is at once a preferential option for life and a preferential option for personal sacrifice. I'm not saying we should not work to create better social structures and laws that combat poverty and offenses to human life. But I am saying that we cannot do so thinking in the back of our mind that someone else, the government, government workers, the bureaucracy, etc., will be making the sacrifices required as a witness to human dignity. <coughs> These sacrifices cannot be alienated from the self. The sacrifice involved in the cultivation of wonder and gratitude in the face of human life, of human dignity, cannot be cultivated by institutions, but only by the persons who create and live within such institutions and who ultimately transcend them. Contemplating the blood of Christ, the believer can afford to contemplate the wonder of human life, of human dignity, with the courage that empowers the sacrifice that will always be necessary. Quote, this outlook does not give in to discouragement when confronted by those who are sick, suffering, outcast, or at death's door. Instead, in all these situations, it feels challenged to find meaning, and precisely in these circumstances, it is open to perceiving in the face of every person a call to encounter dialogue and solidarity, end quote. And the non-believer will find this challenge one step removed, in the face of the believer who bears witness in these situations <coughs> to the primacy of being over having, 
and persons over efficiency. My examination of Evangelium Vitae to conclude. <coughs> Sorry, I'm okay. Thank you. It seems to me has proposed that while human nature is logically and formally prior to human dignity, it is actually the concept of human dignity that is materially and functionally prior. Because it is equivalent to the preferential option, not in the first instance for a thing, for a skill, a capacity, or a status, but for a lack, a nothingness, a diminishment, the poor. And only through that preference can we truly see human nature and not a false positive created in the image of our own preferences for status and potential and power. And as uncomfortable as this may be, this means that the gospel of life, while it presupposes human nature formally, also takes precedence over it materially because it is a preference for a poverty and thus for a sacrifice that has the widest possible extent to those who are considered completely useless and completely deficient and completely unnecessary and completely dispensable. And this not in defiance of the concept of human nature, but so that it is vindicated on its deepest level just at those points where we might be inclined to restrict it or to deny it. The preferential option for the poor is the preferential option for human dignity, and both are indivisible from the gospel of life. Perhaps the prayer closing the encyclical says it all, and we can appropriately close our reflection by meditating on it. O oh Mary, bright dawn of the new world, mother of the living, to you do we entrust the cause of life. Look down, O oh mother, upon the vast numbers of babies not allowed to be born, of the poor whose lives are made difficult, of men and women who are victims of brutal violence, of the elderly and the sick killed by indifference or out of misguided mercy. Grant that all who believe in your son may proclaim the gospel of life with honesty and love to the people of our time. Obtain for them the grace to accept that gospel as a gift ever new, the joy of celebrating it with gratitude throughout their lives, and the courage to bear witness to it resolutely in order to build, together with all the people of goodwill, the civilization of truth and love, to the praise and glory of God, the creator and lover of life. Amen. Thank you. We only have time for one question. Because <laughs> we're quitting at 12.15. It's OK, friends. Everybody's probably hungry. <laughs> so why don't we absolve you from the responsibility of thinking of a question? and. Um, You mentioned uh, some questions. Thank you, Professor Cavadini and my boss. Um, <laughs> it was a wonderful paper. Um, <laughs> but what I would uh, want to ask is you mentioned practices of human dignity. Um, could you say a bit more about the kind of practices, both um, Christian and related to sort of humanizing practices that might sort of support uh, the creation of this culture? Okay, so every time I walk into the um, quote unquote retirement home where my mother is, which is a really great operation, St. Paul, so I don't want, I'm not saying anything against it at all. It's wonderful. Um, but so I walk in at lunchtime, and one of the women seated at, this is the memory unit, one of the women seated at the, at the table was sort of fooling around with her fork, kind of punching it into her gum a little bit. And the aide said, Lita, stop that. So she stopped. And she held her fork, and her the lunch is right there. And she said, now what? 
Well, that is a little funny, at least it was to me. <laughs> and, but you can sit there thinking, this person doesn't even understand that, that now the next step is to use that fork to eat with. You could easily think, this life is just not worth supporting. It just should be erased. You can see from that the, the sacrifice that will be required if you're going to value person's over-efficiency. And I bring that one up because apparently there are a lot of people of goodwill willing to make that sacrifice. All the ones who make that nursing home run, many of them are explicit people of faith, and it is an enterprise based on faith, St. Paul's. It's a Catholic um, operation. But it just means that any, that, that's just an example. I think sometimes when we think of, I don't know, serving the poor, we tend to think of social justice, and I'm all for social justice. Do not hear me as saying as I'm not for social justice, but sometimes social justice itself becomes a thing that you can stamp onto your CV. So um, I did my, but, but if you think of like the indigent elderly, people who don't have any potential, they're not going anywhere except they're gonna die. I mean, ultimately we know, but you can see the, the sacrifice, right, that is, is necessary in order to see the dignity. And unless you're willing to make that sacrifice, you won't, you won't see the dignity. Or the other way around, unless you're willing to accept human dignity as something primary and is in some way crucially coordinated with a uselessness instead of a usefulness, you won't want to make the sacrifice. So that's not maybe a very good answer, but it evokes a very vivid situation in which I think this idea of um, efficient, uh, pers see, I, I prefer efficiency over persons. That's why I always want to say that. But persons over efficiency comes out, and it, it means everybody who goes in there has to do something, a little something, and you feel it as a sacrifice. I, at least I do, anyway. So does that help? Friends, I do really want to let everybody go because we're over. Um, we will reconvene at 1.45, and thank you for listening.